Some students in Detroit are suing the state of Michigan because they weren't taught how to read. Well, yeah, you should be taught how to read, and I'm noticing a trend. I'm noticing that these kids growing up these days are very much not literate um, in many ways. You can tell by their tweets and their snaps and their Instagrams. I mean, they just, you know, they, they're the type of people that don't know the difference between your, Y-O-U-R, and your, Y-O-U apostrophe R-E. Those days are over, man. No one's using Y-O-U apostrophe R-E but me, I feel like. I feel like I'm alone on this Y-O-U apostrophe R-E island out here, right? Am I the only one with some literacy in my brain? <laughs> Alright, I'm just playing. I'm just playing, obviously. Let's get into this article, though. Because this, this, this is a serious situation. We live in a very, very wealthy country. Why aren't our students being taught how to read? Uh, what do you do when a school is infested with vermin? Rats, this kind of thing. Now, I didn't have that at my school, but who knows. Textbooks are outdated. Yep, had that. When students can't even read, perhaps the answer is to sue the government. <laughs> okay, why not? <clears throat> That's what seven students in Detroit have done. Their class action suit filed against the state of Michigan asserts that education is a basic right and they have been denied this basic right. I agree, it is a basic right. And especially when you live in a wealthy country like we do. Uh, unfortunately, not everybody agrees. <laughs> so uh, usually such education equity cases make their way through state courts as all 50 state constitutions mandate public education systems. While the country's guiding document doesn't even include the word, quote, education, but this case was filed in federal court and thus seeks to invoke the Constitution and as of this week it's headed to the Federal Appeals Court in Cincinnati. Ah, this is pretty cool. Uh, the case is a long shot. Later, so late last week, the district court judge in Detroit dismissed it, um, essentially stated that he needed, guide, he, need, he needed guidance from the Supreme Court if he were to weigh in on whether the students' abysmal proficiency levels and learning conditions amount to a violation of the Constitution. He also concluded that the suit makes too many hard-to-prove ca causal claims, even though Michigan subjects the predominantly black Detroit students to conditions to which it doesn't subject, say, predominantly white students of nearby Gross Point, Michigan. Says, uh, still, they say there isn't enough evidence to suggest that the state is treating the former group differently because of their race and thus violating the Equal Protection Clause. Another obstacle is the federal judiciary has, has in grown particularly restrained on educational rights issues in recent decades, in part because of the backlash from parents and other opposed to integration efforts that followed the wave of school desegregation, desegregation rulings in the 70s and 80s. And we had a, we had a big time problem in my community of Boston back then uh, with the desegregation of schools and there was a lot of violence surrounding that and I think we learned that that's not a, a solution. Here's what's a, here's what's a solution though. Uh, m more money being poured into uh, public education. That's, uh, there's, no, there's no excuse for overcrowded classrooms and outdated textbooks and uh, no access to computers and, uh, or, and or art programs. There's no excuse for any of that in this country. Okay. Now this is what always gets me because I look at that pie. If you ever do this, you Google uh, Google that pie chart of uh, uh, the money that our government's, the, our government's spending. And you, you, you look at the pie chart and it's like, it shows you a trillion dollars or whatever the number is. And then it's, it's broken up into where they spend the money. And you see right away that over half of it is spent on military. So you're like, it's like oh, $500 billion a year on military or whatever the number is. It's outrageous. And then you see this tiny little sliver for education. This little, it's like, it's like, 2% of the budget, not even, goes to education. I mean, so, to say that nothing can be done, and to say that this landing on the doorstep of our government uh, is futile, uh, to me is a no argument at all. I mean, th we have the means to do it. We have the funds to do it. We have the resources to do it. For whatever reason, our culture choose not, chooses not to. And I don't know who makes these decisions. I don't know, I mean, we could all go, we could vacillate between you know, it's, it's the citizens themselves to it's some sort of top-down, you know, conspiracy theory with the, the Illuminati's keeping us uneducated <laughs> and they're spraying chemtrails over our heads. But look at I don't want to dive into like a cartoon epistemology here. I want to keep it, I want to keep it practical. And I'm just going to say, it's enough to just look at the chart and you can see that uh, uh, this culture, uh, if, if a reflection of the government spending is also a reflection of where they value what they value in our culture, you can see that educating the youth isn't very valuable for whatever reason. And uh, so I, do I think these people have a case? I think, I don't know. 
but it's nice that they bring attention to it, you know, so then people like me can um, put it out there as a story and people can talk about it as a talking point. This is extremely important. Should we be spending over half of our nation's budget on building missiles and, and bigger ways, faster ways to kill more and more people from a distance? No, no, we don't need to do that, okay? We can curtail some of that spending in lieu of, you know, building a basic foundation of strength, which is the future, which is our youth. And if you're not spending time and money and you're not paying attention to the youth and building a strong youth, what, what are you as a nation, you know? There's no excuse for classrooms to have 50 kids per teacher. There's no excuse for classrooms to be infested with rats. There's no, it, there's no excuse for kids not to have access to computers. There's no excuse for any of this. Okay? This can be done. This isn't even a funny story. I'm taking it to a very, very serious place. And the anarchist in, in me is coming out, as you can tell. And I could be our leader, guys, if we can all get behind... <laughs> I'm kidding. I can't be in charge of anything. <laughs> all right? But I think there's something here. And, you know, I put this out there to my fellow weirdos. Do you think uh, they should be able to sue the government? Do you think the government is responsible? Do you, do you agree with me that there's a lack of literacy in our, uh, in our youth? Uh, I think if you're paying attention at all, I think you can see that. Uh, and not just Detroit, all over. Not just poorer communities, but affluent communities as well. Um, I did a story a couple months ago about you know, kids who were uh, in the school. They were, they were demanding and they had a meeting on uh, ending homework something like that. And the school superintendent was on board with that, which was crazy to me. I mean, th these are things we need to pay attention to because the kids need to be educated, okay? And there's a, there's a way to do it. And uh, we have the means and we have the resources. It's just a matter of uh, us getting together and getting on board and, and doing the administrative things and the things that you need to do in a democracy, which is how do you get people to agree? How do you get people to, to vote, to, to push funds in one direction instead of another? I mean, it's complicated, but I think you guys can figure it out because you're my weirdo.